Hi, this is Misha, and today's video is on the Swiss Schmidt Rubin K31 series. And in my hands is the original 1889 Schmidt Rubin rifle, chambered for 7.5 by 53 GP90. That's the original Swiss cartridge. Well, this rifle's roots go back to 1882 when Edward Rubin developed a small diameter cartridge. He actually made a couple of different ones, 7.5, 8mm, a few different prototypes. And then later when smokeless powder came along, he adopted his small cartridge, caliber cartridge, to smokeless powder. So that's where the round came from. The straight pull action was designed by Rudolf Schmidt, a former uh, officer in the Swiss military. So that's where the Schmidt Rubin name came from. These were in development from 1885 until 1888. They were adopted in 1899, obviously. They also went into production that year. And between 1889 and 1897, they produced about 212,000. So about a eight year production run with over 200,000 built. This was the front line infantry weapon in Switzerland for a time, but it has kind of an interesting story. Even before these were adopted, many in the military were concerned that this straight pull system wasn't strong enough. And as you can see, the locking lug here and over here are towards the rear of the bolt, which means they lock up towards the rear of the receiver. Well, many were concerned this wasn't strong enough. So even before this weapon was adopted, they actually asked Schmidt to redesign it, moving the lugs forward or something else to strengthen it. Well, he refused, so the gun went into production as it was. Now, starting from the muzzle, we have a 31-inch barrel, typical blade front sight, bayonet lug, stacking rod here, Full length handguard, as you can see. We've got an adjustable rear sight. Squeeze it here to pull it up, then let go and it stays in position. Squeeze. We've got a receiver with several lightning cuts. We have a 12 round magazine with a feed cutoff. This right here turns it on off and this also removes your magazine if you pull it down and out you can pull your mag out it, most of the mag was detachable just for cleaning essentially the 12 round mag was meant to be fixed inside of the gun back here is your safety it's a room safety obviously you can recock the action with it to safe the gun just put your finger in and twist and now not only is it on safe it's also decocked and you're good to go Swivels. Not to get into too much of the details, we have a blog article with, with a lot of them. But as I said, they wanted um, Schmidt to strengthen the action. He refused. So in 1892, they actually turned the task over to another military officer named Vogelsen. And he discovered that he could easily move the lugs further forward on the bolt by just making a new sleeve, making a new firing pin, new firing pin spring, and making a, a different cuts in the receiver and changing the stock a little bit. But essentially just changing this section back here, he could actually strengthen the bolt by moving the lugs further forward. When they tested this in 1895, they discovered that it led to tighter bolt lockup, greater accuracy. This was always a very accurate gun, as most Swiss guns are, but it made it even more accurate with the further move forward lugs in the middle of the bolt, uh, stronger, uh, fewer bolt cracks, fewer lugs cracking, which is overall a better design. The only thing was they discovered pretty quickly that it wasn't really economical to retrofit all the old 1889s with the new bolt system. It could be done, but it would be very expensive. So they actually went with a new model called the 1889-96. 
and it looked identical to this original 1889, still firing the GP90 cartridge. It just had uh, the bolt lugs further forward, it was stronger, so on and so forth. But it still used the 12 round mag, still had the 31 um, inch barrel. They would make about 137,000 of the 8996 rifle, and that becomes important. We'll get to in just a minute why we're talking about it. But since they don't have an 1889-96, and really no one does because all of them were, were transformed into, into a different model, we'll just use this one as an example to talk about it because externally they look the same. But the, these were the straight pull we weapons used in Switzerland in the late 19th century. It was Switzerland's first smokeless powder rifle. Um, they would remain in auxiliary service through World War I and even in emergency service up to World War II, you can fire 7.5 GP11 in one, however, not many times. The action's not strong enough. If you habitually fire it, you will crack the bolt lugs and eventually shear off things and, and break the gun. So while you can get 7.5 GP11 to fire in these, it is extremely not advisable to the point of being unsafe. Well, that was the Schmidt Rubin rifle. And initially they were going to make, manufacture a carbine version, as they did with the uh, Vetterly before. However, the action, because it is so long, was hard to make into a carbine. In 1893, a series of trials were held to select a carbine for use by the Swiss cavalry and other units like artillery. And this is what eventually was adopted. This is not a Schmidt Rubin. This is a Steyr 1893 carbine. As I said, the, the Schmidt Rubin action just wasn't, it was big, it was long, it wasn't really strong, so they didn't really want to use it in a carbine. So instead, they adopted this Steyr design. It was went up against a couple of designs from Mauser, a couple of designs out of Switzerland, but eventually the Steyr design won. Actually, even the, the this is a straight pull. Get the safety off here, that usually helps on these. This is a straight pull Steyr. They also put their turn bolt version up, but the straight pull is selected so it would have a similar manual of arms to the Schmidt ribbon. This has a 21 and a half inch barrel. It still fires the GP90 7.5 round. No provision for a bayonet lug. Protected front sight. Full length upper handguard. Side mounted sling swivel. The rear sight's quite interesting, this quadrant style. If you notice, here you can see a battle sight in the front that's fixed and in the rear you've actually got a flip up secondary sight which can be adjusted for elevation by squeezing it much like on the uh, full size Schmidt ribbon. Kind of interesting. This is essentially the same bolt action that you'll later see on the Steyr M95 rifle and carbine used by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is much stronger than the Schmidt Rubin. It's also shorter and somewhat lighter. Now this uses a six round, easily detachable box mag, unlike the Steyr 1895 double stack box. Again though, these weren't really they only issued one mag per gun. These are mostly just removable for cleaning and maintenance and replacement. Also, my nice thing in a lot, huh? Not something I take out too frequently either. That's oh, gonna fight me. I definitely didn't reverse it. Sure, I've done here. Oh, this thing likes to slide out. That's what it was. The follow will slide out on you. But yeah, the 1893 carbine was in some was was in use. Originally, these were manufactured by uh, 
Sig, uh, Steyr in Austria in 1894, and then they went into production in Switzerland between 1895 and 1906. They were made by both Sig and Bern, and about 7,750 were produced in total, so not a very large number. Well, they were short, they were light compared to the Schmidt Rubin, and the action was stronger, but these were very unpopular guns by the troops. The, this bolt system is complicated to take apart, certainly more so than the Schmidt Rubin style. Many complained that it wasn't accurate enough, which is not surprising for a gun with an under 22 inch barrel, especially considering the Swiss standards for marksmanship. But mostly it suffered from the not made here. It wasn't an internal Swiss design, it wasn't domestically produced. So I think that is kind of earned it a negative reputation right out of the gate. I think it's a very interesting carbine, but by World War I, most of these were already being pulled out of service in favor of more modern designs, which we'll get to in just a second. But yeah, the 1893 Steyr carbine. You can read a lot of stories about Swiss soldiers intentionally destroying these weapons when they're issued them, hoping to get issued a Schmidt Rubin. I'm not sure how true those are, probably at least some truth in them, but um, certainly not a whole lot it still exists in the world today. They, uh, they were well used and then uh, often abused in service and just not that many still exist, but it's definitely an interesting piece of uh, Swiss history and an interesting Steyr variant as well. Alrighty, we'll move on. Alright, next up we have an 1896-11 rifle. Now this is essentially the same rifle as the 1889, except it has the bolt lugs. Get that on. This one's a little stiff. If you see, they're moved further forward on the sleeve. They're towards the front of the sleeve. Barely see them here. That's the mechanical difference that you saw in the 8996. Well, in 1903, the Swiss military became interested in going to a Spitzer type bullet, a more modern uh, type bullet. In 1907, they gave the project to the Bern factory to design a new projectile and a new rifle to go with. Well, in 1911, that's what came out. The new 7.5 by 55 GP11 round was vastly superior to the old GP90. It was more accurate, it was harder hitting with more penetration, and it gave longer range. Well, because they had done, Vogelsung had done the uh, upgrade of the original rifle in the 19th century, they were simply able to uh, rebarrel their existing 1889-96 rifles to fire the new round. So what they would do Starting in 1911, they would rebarrel the old action with new barrels that already have the sights attached. They would just barrel it on using the same bolt and receiver. They also went to a newer pattern of six round, easy, more easily detachable magazine <coughs> instead of the 12. And they also grafted on the semi pistol grip on the stock. You can see a seam here. If you see an 1896-11 rifle with the seam here, that's correct. It's actually a nicely dovetailed and, and kind of uh, cemented in, plate, in place little uh, semi-pistol grip for a little better grip. Mm. And the easy way to tell the 1896-11 from the purpose-built 1911 rifles is this butt plate. Your, the original guns are going to have more of a curved butt plate, both side to side and top down, more curvature. Well, initially, starting in 1911, as I said, they were converting these old rifles. Out of the 137,089-96 rifles that were initially made, 136,000 were converted to the new pattern. So only about 1,000 to 1,030 of the original guns remain. That's why finding an original 1896 is nearly impossible. There's less than you know, just over 1,000 left in the world. Well, they did that, and then starting in 1913, they started doing purpose-built 1911 rifles. 
looks exactly the same as this, except again, it has a different butt plate and it won't have this grafted on semi pistol grip. It'll just have that carved as part of the stock. This was Switzerland's standard issue weapon during World War I. Then they're during that era, even though obviously Switzerland was neutral, but it was what they were issuing. These were, would remain in standard production until around 1919, give or take. And they would produce about 127,000 of the 1911 purpose built guns to it add to the 136,000 conversions. So, you know, about a quarter million total, a little over a quarter million in military service. These were officially retired in 1953, but many would remain in service until 1960, somewhere in that era. Nice Schmidt Rubin straight pull. This does have a bolt hold open follower, so on an empty magazine, you, you know. It's still fed by stripper clips as the older designs, even though the mag is removable. Still has a nice beer keg cocking handle made of Bakelite, like the earlier ones. Same exact safety. Again, this was this particular rifle here was originally in 1889-96. It was converted, so it's going to have a lot of the same features. It's going to have this uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 31 inch barrel with with the same bayonet lug. The rear sights are slightly modernized. Same basic sight picture, but instead of just squeezing and lifting up, now it's more of a sliding ladder, more you know modern style. The lightning cuts on the receiver were slightly changed as well. A few, little fewer lightning cuts to make it stronger. But other than that, that's about it. It's a good, solid gun. And um, it was a standard issue for a long time. Now to go along with it, they finally did go to a Schmidt Rubin carbine. This is the K11 carbine. This was the first wide issue mass produced carbine in Swiss military service, but there were a few forerunners. For example, there was the 1889 1900 or 00 uh, Fortress carbine, which had a 23 inch barrel, I believe. And it was basically the same thing as the Schmidt Rubin 1889 long rifle, except it had a cut down four stock and uh, so on and so forth. It also used a six round mag, which this one still does, which becomes standard. There was also the 1905 carbine, which had a 22 inch barrel and had the same style of stock and sights as the 1893 cavalry carbine made by Steyer. Actually, as the uh, 1905 was produced, they would take old 1893s out of service. They didn't make many. They made about, oh, about 14,000, 15,000 of the 89900 carbines and about 8,000 of the 1905 carbines. So a few here and there is needed. They were both chambered for the older GP90 round. But when they went to the 1911 rifle, they designed this K31, uh, excuse me, K11 carbine to go with. These went into production in 1913 and were, would remain in production until about hmm, 1930, 1932, somewhere in that era. They would produce about 181,000 of these, so definitely a lot more than previous carbine models. Also, a lot of the older Fortress and 1905 carbines would be converted into the K11. So you'll see a lot of older guns converted over with the new GP11 barrel and sights and stocks and so forth. Mechanically, this operates exactly the same as the long rifle. The bolts, the lugs move forward with uh, that there with the hold open. This has a 23 inch barrel, so slightly longer than the 1893, but not by a whole lot. We've got a protected front sight here. Same style rear sight, a little bit shorter. And we have side mounted sling swivels or swing sling studs. 
these became very popular after the war in the 1920s and essentially became the de facto standard in Switzerland. So even though the 1911 long rifle was officially the standard issue, K11s became very widely used and, and preferred in that it's a lot lighter. You're not sacrificing a whole lot on range and accuracy because the GP11 cartridge is so accurate. So, you know, this kind of became much more common than the long rifle. Like the long rifle, these would be retired in 1953, but would remain in service through the early to mid 60s. And a lot of officers and soldiers would uh, purchase these and, and take them home and use them for competition. And uh, I personally really like the K11. I like this big bolt that's in it. You take the bolt out. These are really easy to take out. Just press this button here. And it just straight up removes. But yeah, this is the, um, the large Schmidt ribbon style bolt. These disassemble extremely easily. You just put the safety in a half, or not half cock, but halfway position, and then the whole thing just kind of comes apart and unscrews. Your, your cocking piece comes off. And, very easy for cleaning and maintenance, but as you can see, it is a very long bolt. The lugs are forward on this one. On the original, they would have been back here. This is how they moved them from here to here. Just showing that. But definitely one of the larger bolts in the military service. But very reliable, very fast to operate. It's pretty good. These are really finely made guns. Like anything Swiss, very light, nice triggers on these. As you can see, like we we're talking about with the uh, rifle, this has a more flat butt plate because it's a purpose built, along with having this semi pistol grip that is carved as part of the stock, just to show you a purpose built gun. Yeah, this is the K11, the first mass issue carbine in Switzerland. We'll move on. Alright, and this is probably the most famous straight pull Swiss rifle. This is the K31. Now this is often called a Schmidt Rubin, I understand why, because it's a straight pull Swiss gun firing 7.5 GP11, much like the last three we looked at, save the Steyr carbine there, which is number four. But it's not. It's actually mechanically a very different gun. So this is not really a Schmidt Rubin any longer, although it definitely takes design cues from it. This is kind of the culmination of Switzerland using the straight pull gun for over 40 years. They, they learned lessons, they, they figured out what they wanted. Well, as I said in the last video, in the, in the 1920s, the, the K-11 became vastly popular. So in 1929, the Swiss military said um, that they wanted a rifle that had the same dimensions, the same length and weight as the K-11, but it needed to be as accurate as the 1911 rifle. Also, it would be really good if it was cheaper and faster to mass produce because the Schmidt Rubin was costly. So, um, a team at Bern went to work, and in, and in 1931, this rifle here was uh, unveiled. And it is, um, you know, objectively a better gun. I kind of like the older guns just for the old world craftsmanship. Not to say that the K31 isn't an extremely well made gun, but the older ones are just extremely, I just have to have that old feel to them. Anyway, what they did, and I'm going to pull this bolt out because it's easier to illustrate that way. They went to a new style of straight pull bolt. As you can see, we looked at the Schmidt Rubin bolt. This is much more cylindrical, much simpler as far as that goes, and it's much shorter. It also has the bolt lugs at the extreme front. Whereas before they were in the middle, and first they were in the back. So they, the lugs have continued to move further forward. Also now you have a metal caulking piece as opposed to bagel out in the previous ones. Same style ring safety. 
Now because the bolt is shorter, this meant the um, has the uh, hold up the mag on this too, of course. Because the bolt was shorter, this allowed for a shorter receiver. Now remember, we want to keep the same overall length as the K11. But since we have a shorter receiver and bolt, they were actually able to go to a 25 inch, not a 23 inch barrel, so they gained two extra inches, which really makes this more of a short rifle than a carbine. It also meant it was more accurate. And also the barrels free floated. And finally, they improved the, the sights somewhat. So between these three changes, they were able to gain some accuracy over the K11. Was it as accurate as the 1911 rifle? Probably not quite, but it was close, it was accurate enough. In field testing, they discovered the, the new bolt system was stronger, more reliable, and uh, this was a faster and easier to machine gun. It was, it was easier to produce. It also went to a new pattern of six round detachable mag that was more reliable and easier to make. It's more of a squared off mag. And while they were at it, eh, I can pull that one back in the clipboard. They actually tuned the trigger, making an already nice trigger even better. So the K31 is going to have a really nice feeling trigger. They updated the stock a little bit, made it a little bit beefier here. Still have the semi pistol grip. Still have the side mounted sling. Swivels, front protected side, same bay in that lug and stacking rod. Well, after a few tweaks and improvements, these went into service, were officially adopted in 1932, and between the original 1931 date and 1958, they produced about 528,000, so quite a bit more, about twice as many of these as the old. 1911 rifle and even more of these and the, the, all the previous Schmidt Rubens kind of put together. So quite a few. In 1946, the, probably the biggest change happened. They went from using stocks made of walnut to stocks made of beech wood. Otherwise the design remains remarkably uniform and consistent over the 25 year production period that they were in, in production. So yeah, this is the probably the most famous and popular Swiss straight pull. Quite a few of these have been imported into the USA over the last 10 years. At one time they were as cheap as uh, $90. Now they're back up to about $350, maybe even $400 for a nice one. You will find some that have troop tags stored under the butt plate. They're held on under the screw here. It's just a little uh, kind of plasticized paper tag under the butt plate. So if you have one, you might look for one of those. Quite a few of these were purchased out by the soldiers who were issued them. You know, it's extremely accurate, extremely well-made gun. And in Swiss service, they were very reliable. Now, would these have fared so well on the Eastern Front in Russia with all the dirt and mud and without having regular maintenance, say as well as a Mosin or even a Mauser? Probably not. This is a more complicated bolt system. And in you know, as we mentioned in the Ross rifle video and the Steyr 95 video, straight pull guns do have weaker primary extraction. Although this gun has very good primary extraction for what it is, a nice big claw extractor. If it got muddy, you know, it might impact reliability a little bit. But since the Swiss soldiers kept their guns well maintained, well oiled, well greased up with that grease that you know, the Swiss grease you always see, and you know, they weren't being rolled in the mud too much. They, they remained in good shape and they, they worked well in the conditions that they were um, meant for. Now, interestingly, these Schmidt Rubens you've seen in this K31, Switzerland never really exported these. These were all made for internal Swiss use, the, either by the military or private shooters in that country. So, um, yeah, you don't, they, they never really had an export model. These were all used inside. See the nice big Swiss cross on here across the shield. Yeah, very interesting, very well-made guns, extremely fun in 
and enjoyable to shoot. They, they shoot very well. These things are laser accurate. They have just enough recoil to make them fun, but not so much that they're unpleasant. The straight pull system is very smooth and easy to use. They, they top off using uh, stripper clips, which are over-engineered, typical Swiss. The ammo actually comes in little cigarette pack boxes that hold ten. You have you have a, has a little pull tab that you tear the pipe, the paper, and then there's ten rounds. Just all around, very well made, very neat guns, and typical Swiss. But yeah. K31. And again, it's officially a carbide, but I would call it a short rifle. But it, they met their goals. It was cheaper and easier to produce, and it was the size of a K11 with the accuracy nearly of the 1911. We'll move on. And for our final rifle today, we're going to revisit the Stungewehr 1957. Now, You've already seen this rifle in one of our other videos, but I wanted to talk a little more about its history. This is what replaced the K31. Well, throughout the 1940s and or 1950s, Switzerland experimented with a lot of semi-automatic and select fire infantry rifle type designs. Well, you had a gentleman Rudolf Amsler, that eventually developed what became known as the AM-55 at the SIG factory, and that was the prototype version of this rifle here. It was very similar, fired um, 7.5 GP-11. That one had wood furniture and a few other small things. That's the version the Swiss military was interested in. They did some changes and allowed it to launch a rifle grenades and officially adopted it as the STGW 1957 or 57 in 1957. It went into production a short time later and gradually replaced the K31. This gun was inspired mostly by the German MG42 and the prototype STG45M at Mauser because of the roller delayed system that it uses. Also, it disassembles much like an MG42. There's a catch here, you twist the stock off, and then everything comes out the back. So, it's a big massive spring back here, and really disassembles in a neat way. You've got a push pin here for the lower. Well, starting at the muzzle, we've got a 23 inch barrel with integrated muzzle brake, grenade launching ring here, bayonet lug. We've got a flip up front sight with integrated night sight on the top. Obviously this one's dead because it's old. You also have a flip up rear sight, doctor style, adjustable. You have a barrel shroud. Now interestingly we've got a bipod here and it's adjustable. This hair I'm going to sling out of the way. Got the sling on pins there. When the bipod is in the rearward position like this, so I can set this on the table here, the weapon is mostly been, meant to be used as an infantry DMR. Type gun. However, if you move it to the forward position, there's a little catch here you press. to be cooperative. And then it's more of a squad support suppressive fire type gun, the way it's set up. Just kind of different roles it can fulfill. I've always kind of thought it's, it's, it's an infantry rifle, but because of the high sights, the kind of straight line stock, the carry handle here, the folding carry handle, large 24 round magazine for GP11 cartridges. It always has kind of struck me as almost a light machine gun, also with this very vertical polymer grip here. Just the way the gun, the lines of it are, it just kind of strikes me. As a side note, this will take the 30 round mags from the Swiss 
1925 light machine gun. These mags are the same pattern, they're just shorter. But it will take the light machine gun mags as well. Adjustable sight here, there's a little catch you can press in. Adjust your sight. This receiver is made out of two halves of um, welded steel with trunnions. You also have these recesses here where the rollers lock into. They're actually removable. They have large E-clips on them. And the reason you can pull out the uh, roller recesses is to replace them. On a gun like an HKG3, once your roller recesses wear, you pretty much have to replace the trunnion, which means basically scrapping the gun at that point, at least for military service. But the Swiss guns, though, they wanted to keep them in service for a long time, so they let these be interchangeable. As you saw, we've got a small ejection port here, especially for firing such a large cartridge. The reason it is, your extractor also doubles as your ejector, and when it kicks the rounds out, it actually sweeps them out the side, so they actually eject at a 90 degree angle. So they come out kind of butt first and out that small. The reason they went with that small door was to keep as much dirt and mud and snow out as possible. You also have a fold down trigger for winter type use when you're using mittens or gloves. Paddle style mag releases you saw me using earlier. Pull this critter back around. Get this bipod folded back if I can. You've actually got to twist it up. I'm headed in the direction. If it wants to. Of course, it's going to be the other day, the other way where my sling's in the way, isn't it? Yeah, these went in to service in the late 50s, gradually replacing the uh, K31. There we go, so you just push it up like that, and it lets that tank go. And it would remain the standard until the late 80s, and even up till around 1990. In total, about 740,000 would be produced. Now this was produced by SIG, and it's also one of the first Swiss rifles to actually have a, a, a true export model. <clears throat> by the way, this had a three position selector initially. This one's a civilian legal, so it only has two. The full auto capability has, is not, well, not there. Yeah. Oh, and this furniture is made of actually a rubber material, not polymer. Just Anyway, in the commercial market, the SG 510-1 was the export model of this rifle here, and it was offered both in the original 7.5 and 7.62 NATO. The 510-2 was a lightweight model that was about two and a half pounds lighter. It had a shorter barrel, slimmer shroud. It was a prototype that never really went into production. The Dash 3 was the version chambered in 7.62 by 39, and these were designed by SIG for use in Finland. They actually were testing them against several designs, and they actually lost out to the, um, the RK-62. As a side note, these rifles were actually tested in West Germany and designated as the G-2 and lost out to the G-3. Well, the uh, the Dash 4 was probably the most successful model. It was essentially a take on the lightweight model. Now it had tangent rear sights and wood furniture and a slimmer barrel shroud and a shorter 20 inch barrel. And um, it was chambered for 7.62 by 51 NATO. And it was actually adopted by Chile and actually was a standard issue weapon in Chile for, for a couple of decades. It would also be what would inspire the AMT semi-automatic version in 308 imported into the USA. Well, the Dash 5 
was a version of 30-06 chambered and used well in Mexican trials. I'm not even sure if they even get you even if they get sent over to Mexico, but originally they uh, SIG actually designed them for Mexican trials, but I don't think it ever went into in, in, in kind of production or even testing. I'm not sure the trials ever went anywhere. Come on. This actually hooks into them those little slots and then you pull this thing up. But yeah, those are the versions of the, uh, the SIG rifle here. In the USA, there's been a few semi-autos imported over the years. The PE-57 was a semi-auto ver semi version, and about 500 were imported back in the 80s. The AMT was in 308, and about uh, close to 3,000 were imported back in the 80s as well. So about 3,500 of these total of two different versions were brought back in back in the day. Most chambered for 308, a few of the P-57s and 7.5. But yeah, this, these were, new rifles were mostly made up to the 70s, and then SIG was still selling them as late as 1985, but it seems like the guns from the 80s were, were assembled from uh, leftover parts and receivers left over from a production. So, so the main production ended in the 70s, because after that they were getting into designing their newer uh, 223 5.6 millimeter type guns. And we have a video on as well called the SIG. 550 family, so I want to check those out, that'd be good. But yeah, this particular gun is an AM57-1 made by uh, Honey Creek Industries. You've seen us shooting it before, and this video was more on the history of this gun, but this is a U.S. made version. What my friend did when he built these, he had an original PE57, and he basically just copied copied the original design, but he did submit his receiver to the ATF and get approval, so it's all in the up and up. This is an original matching kit assembled onto one of his receivers. It shoots great. We've had it out, probably put a few hundred rounds to it. You know, at the price of GP11, you can't really afford to put a couple of thousand rounds through, but we've never had any failures out of it. It's an original mag. These mags are interesting. They're machined from a single block of uh, aluminium. Some will have metal followers, others will have polymer. This pistol grip does store a small cleaning kit in it, and also mine here has a small uh, Swiss night sight. Kind of interesting. But definitely one of, the, one of the neatest and most unique guns. And um, very large, my hand's already getting tired of holding it. And uh, not exceedingly heavy, but after a while, because it's a kind of a lanky gun, it has a lot of spread out large but extremely well made, typical Swiss quality. But yeah, the Swiss STGW 57, the semi-automatic version is called the PE 57. Just a really neat piece and one of the most unique guns out there. Is that it is a roller locked type gun, similar to a G3, but more based on the MG42 than anything else. It was kind of developed in parallel. In fact, these were adopted two years before Germany even adopted the G3, so technically this predates the G3, although not the Spanish set me, of course. Those first appeared around 1955-1956, so they predate this one by about two years. I thought we'd just revisit it. It's one of my favorite interesting rifles, and it goes well with the rest of the Sprint Rubin and K31 we showed you today. If you have any questions at all, please post them below. If you want to look at more Swiss guns, please check out our video on Swiss handguns and as I said, also on the SG550 family. And also we have a uh, blog article, so uh, I pretty much like Swiss guns, they're interesting. This is Misha, and as always, thanks for tuning in.